Yamamoto still absent from the base, Onishi presses his deputy, Commander Tamai, to put the proposal to the men. Tamai agrees on the condition that those who volunteer may form a new unit with their own name. Fighting over the previous months has taken a heavy toll on the 201st, and those surviving are in a state of constant tension. In present conditions, few of them expect to survive the war. The enemy is fast approaching. The danger to their homeland growing by the hour, the fate of Japan may rest with them. All of the pilots agree to be part of the special attack unit, and as arranged, the men are to choose a new name. An officer with the group suggests a title befitting men who will deliver their country from its aggressors. Shimpu, whose two characters in Chinese mean God and Wind. All present know this means the winds which sank the Mongol fleet, divine winds, known to them by a different name, Kamikaze. On October the 20th, the first U.S. Marines go ashore on the island of Leyte. Onishi addresses the special attack unit, or Tokatai, as they will become known, announcing that operations will begin the next morning and assuring them that the Emperor will hear personally of their sacrifice. That same afternoon, some of the group fly to the airfield at Cebu, hoping to encourage other pilots to join with them. The men of Cebu choose to follow their comrades as Tokotai. While on the beaches of Leyte, the U.S. Marines are as yet little disturbed by enemy aircraft. On October the 21st, the first of the Kamikaze take off for glory. Unable to find their targets, they return only to have their planes attacked on the ground by U.S. fighters. There is, however, one spontaneous effort by a pilot not from the Tokatai. He crashes his plane into the cruiser Australia, inflicting heavy casualties. On the 22nd, more Japanese troops and equipment are dispatched for the defense of Leyte. At Imperial High Command, it is deemed that Sho will be the decisive battle to bring about the destruction of the U.S. fleet. With three Japanese naval task forces steaming for the Philippines, the second air fleet sends a large detachment to Manila. Their task is to launch a massive strike against the U.S. fleet the day before Japan's warships arrive. Onishi suggests that the second air fleet join with the Tokatai. Their commander rejects the suggestion out of hand. On the 24th of October, the massive wave attack takes place. Japanese planes, using conventional tactics, sink one carrier and three smaller ships. The cost is high, with more than 100 planes shot down. The approaching Japanese battle groups have no better luck. Attacks from submarines, aircraft and surface ships decimate the force. On the same evening, Admiral Nishimura, commanding one of the Japanese task forces, succeeds in sailing his ships right into the sights of a U.S. battle group, allowing all the American guns to open broadside upon his startled fleet. By the end of the evening, the toll on combined Japanese forces is three battleships, six cruisers and seven destroyers. And all this before any of them reaches their objective. There is hardly a ship in the Japanese fleet which hasn't sustained some damage. After the failure of Sho, the first hint of success comes on the 25th when the kamikazes sink a carrier and damage several others. By comparison, attacks during the day by conventional methods inflict little damage and sustain heavy losses. News of the special attack is relayed to the Emperor. 
After his initial shock, he sends a message of congratulations to the unit. The Kamikazes have received the Imperial Seal of Approval. Onishi now uses the Emperor's words to bolster his recruiting drive for the Tokotai. During the following days, several sorties are flown by the Kamikazes of the Philippines. From the outset, every unit is accompanied by observers sent to report on the glorious achievements of each attack. This system tends to cloud the accuracy of the claims, as the observers are reluctant to report that any of their comrades have made their sacrifice in vain. It is likely that the kamikazes, successful as they are, may only be achieving 10% of the damage claim. As the Leyte invasion rolls on, Admiral Onishi begins to refine the procedures and ceremony for the kamikazes. From the outset, the kamikaze unit is shrouded in ceremony and mysticism. The Hakimachi, a white headband which in samurai times indicated that the warrior was preparing to fight to the death, is introduced to the uniform. A pre-flight toast is also given for the pilots. In the early days, this is with sacred water. In later times, the water will be replaced by sake. With the continuing progress of the Allied forces, the future for both the Philippines and Japan is looking bleak. By the end of October, the only ray of light for the high command are the kamikazes. Traditionally, attacks against shipping were the sole preserve of the Navy air arm. Army pilots have never received training in this very different sort of combat. By early November, the Navy no longer has an air arm to speak of. The Army will now have to share the responsibility for attacks against shipping in defense of the homeland. In light of this, it is announced that a recent group of 1,000 Army flying graduates will immediately become kamikaze pilots. The kamikazes are now starting to take their toll on the morale as well as the ships of the U.S. Navy. The early attacks were treated as fluke or eccentric. Now it is clear that it is something much more organized. Radio Tokyo speaks of a new wonder weapon and the U.S. fleet continues to be attacked by a most frightening adversary. Aboard the American ships, men who want to live are fighting against an enemy determined to die. On the 5th of November, the first official army squadron of kamikazes leaves to attack the landing force at Leyte. En route to their target, they encounter U.S. bombers. All of the kamikazes ram the U.S. planes. An imperial edict is issued shortly after naming the Falling Stars as national heroes. From this point, kamikaze operations take a new direction. Attacks are switched from carriers to U.S. transport ships in a bid to stave off the invasion of Luzon. Heavy bombers are now to be used in kamikaze units, and efforts are also made to increase cooperation between the Imperial Army and Navy in place of their traditional rivalry. The U.S. naval anchorage at Ulithi is the target of the next phase of the Tokatai program. On the 20th of November, the Khitan or human torpedoes make their debut. Only one of the Khitan succeeds in hitting a target, an oil tanker filled with aviation fuel. The explosions are enormous, and the Japanese are led to believe that these wonder weapons are responsible for sinking at least three carriers. The truth is, the chitin are unstable and prone to going out of control, the majority of them killing their pilots before they reach their targets. In order to slow down the American progress, another large conventional attack is planned against the U.S. anchorage off Leyte. On the 25th of November, an important Japanese supply convoy en route to the Philippines and ships in Manila Harbor are destroyed by planes from two U.S. carrier groups stationed off Luzon. 